next statistic is going to blow you away. Of the 17,000 people groups in the world, 7,000 are unreached, 5,000 are unengaged. What does that mean? That means there is no attempt. That there's no attempt. No one is going to them. Uh, by the way, they're, they're unreached for a reason. Because they're difficult to go to. Maybe uh, the religious barriers, you know, you go there and tell people about Christ, they'll kill you. That, that's a religious barrier. Uh, a lot of these, there's geographical barriers, you know, they're, they're hard to get to. The fact of the matter is, uh, I read a statistic recently uh, that 85% um, of all American missionaries go to the same 15 countries. Nobody's signing up to go to the unreached because it's very difficult to live there, right? So these statistics started hitting me right, right between the eyes, uh, really breaking my heart, burdening my heart. And the one statistic that really got me, as Preacher has already mentioned, is that there are ref roughly 7,000 languages in the world today. Of those 17,000 people groups, there are 7,117 languages among those 17,000 people groups. And of the 7,000 languages, almost 4,000 of them do not even have one verse of Scripture in their language. And so God used that to break my heart burden my heart to call our family uh, from being in the in the pastorate, so to speak. Uh, you, you know, I was a pastor and, and a pastor's family, and then we resigned, and now we're missionaries with an independent Baptist scripture translation ministry focusing on the unreached. And uh, as you know, you're very well aware, you support one of our projects, and I, I've been to Nepal, Kathmandu, Nepal. I've sat at the table with the Bible translators, and uh, your uh, sacrifice and your generosity and your giving spirit, uh, you are laying up treasure in heaven as you give to the Tibetan project. So thank you so much uh, for that. That's a wonderful thing. So all of that to say, God has, um, our story is this, God has, has moved us from being pastor to being a missionary to uh, serve with a, a Bible translation ministry called Worldview Ministries. One of our projects, as you are aware, you already know most of the anyway, um, one of our projects is complete. We shared this with you last time we were with you. This is the Runyon Quarry New Testament. And there's a people group in Uganda uh, of over 5 million that now have a New Testament Amen. from Worldview Ministries. This represents 11 years of hard work, 200 man hours a week. It costs from start to finish, about $250,000. And, um, and so if you want to see this, it'll be on the table after the service. If you don't know uh, Runyon Corey, it's not going to mean a whole lot to you. But uh, you can flip through it, and I know it'll be a blessing to you. And so um, many, many more people groups are still waiting, right? They're still waiting for, for a Bible. And so we praise the Lord for the privilege of serving with Worldview Ministries. Uh, as you come to your uh, missions conference uh, this week, there are, by way of introduction, there are three things uh, that I believe every believer needs to understand regarding missions, okay? And I'm just going to give these to you very quickly, all right? And then we're going to look at our text. Number one, the Bible is a missions manual, okay? We need to understand that. The Bible is the record of redemption's story. Amen. Oh, what a Savior. Amen. Amen. Uh, we, we read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, that Christ died for our sins according to the what? Yeah. Scriptures. <laughs> and that He was buried and rose again the third day according to the <laughs> Scriptures. Oh, what a Savior. Amen. Amen. And so the Bible is a missions manual, number one. Number two, the church is a missions agency. The hero in missions, other than the Lord Jesus Christ, obviously, the hero is the church. According to Acts 13, we looked at it today, the church sends out missionaries. Missionaries return and answer and give an account to the church. The church is the hero in missions other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Bible is a missions manual. The church is a missions agency. And number three... <laughs> Every Christian is a missionary. Yeah. Amen. Um, 
You say, Brother Bill, I know the dictionary definition of a missionary, and I am not a missionary. If you look up the dictionary definition of a missionary, you'll find that it is an individual that goes to a foreign field to represent their religion. I'm not talking about the dictionary definition of a missionary. I'm talking about the divine uh, definition of a missionary. You, if you're saved, you are salt, you are light. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Whether you are, are good, a good ambassador or not, you are an ambassador. Uh, and so with that in mind, look with me at our text this morning, Matthew chapter 28. We want to get reacquainted this morning with Matthew chapter number 28. We have before us a, a portion of scripture that has come to be known as the Great Commission. Sadly, to many individuals, it is looked at as a gentle suggestion. But it is not a gentle suggestion. It is uh, the Great Commission. And we want to look at that this morning. And look with me, if you will, at Matthew chapter 28. And we'll begin reading in verse number 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. For just a few minutes this morning, let's look at this truth, this thought from this text, Great Commission, or great omission. Great commission or great omission. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together. Father, we thank you so very much for the opportunity to be in your house today. We thank you for how our hearts have already been blessed by being here. We thank you, uh, Father, for the fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you so very much for the wonderful music uh, that just touches our heart and gives all attention to the one that deserves it most, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Sunday school hour and how our hearts have already been challenged uh, by your word today. And Father, at this time, we just pray that you would use the power of your word and the power of your spirit to do a spiritual work in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in our church family, and in our circle of influence, even today as you've called us to be salt and light in this wicked, dark world. Father, I preach in faith this morning uh, that if I proclaim your truths without apology, that you will do a spiritual work in our midst. And Father, I pray that those listening would listen in faith and open their hearts to whatever you have for them. If there's even one here today without Christ, I pray that they would be saved before it is too late. And we will thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen five different times and at five different locations the Great Commission was given. Did you know that? I think that you will agree with me that when something is repeated twice in the Bible, it ought to get special attention. But how much more when something is repeated five different uh, times? Although we do not find the title in Scripture, Great Commission, I want to submit to you that the Great Commission is without a doubt the greatest commission of all time. Um, this morning, here is our outline. I'll just give it to you and then uh, we'll go along here in just a moment. But this morning, we want to look at one commission. We want to look at two considerations. In other words, two things that every Christian ought to consider regarding the Great Commission. And then we want to look at three questions. Three questions every believer needs to ask to help us discern where we stand with the greatest commission that has ever been given. So that's our outline this morning. One commission, two considerations, and three questions. All right, first of all, number one, one commission. As I said a moment ago, the Great Commission is the greatest commission of all time. Let me give you some reasons for that this morning. Let me give you some reasons why the Great Commission is without a doubt the greatest commission of all time. First of all, uh, the Great Commission affects the greatest commandments. What are the greatest commandments? We find them a couple times in the Gospels, but one such place is Mark chapter 12 and verses, I think it's verse 30 and 31 or 31 and 32, where the Bible says this, Love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, 
and love our what as ourself? Yeah. Our neighbor as ourself. You say, Brother Bill, what does that have to do with the Great Commission? Well, number one, if your neighbor is, is not saved, if they're not a Christian, if they're not a believer, they certainly are not loving the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and mind. And if you've never witnessed to your neighbor, you certainly cannot say that you love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Yeah. And, and, hey, every preacher in America that's worth his soul has one consuming passion for every person that darkens the doorstep of that church, and that is, are they saved? On their, are they on their way to heaven? Are they a believer? Are they Christian? Uh, are they a blood-bought child of God? Every parent worth his soul has one consuming passion for their children, and that is that their children be saved and on their way to heaven. Yeah. And listen, yeah. any Christian worth their salt... By the way, we are the salt of the world, the salt of the earth. Yeah. Has one consuming passion for every individual that they come into contact with every moment of every day, and that is, are they saved or are they lost? Listen, the Great Commission affects the greatest commandments. Number two, the Great Commission affects the greatest communication. The Great Commission affects the greatest communication. It's already been mentioned today, but what is the greatest communication? It's the gospel of the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And according to 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel, a definition of the gospel is given to us very clearly, very plainly. It is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. The gospel it means good news. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is the greatest news anyone on this earth could ever hear. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. And so the Great Commission affects the greatest communication. John 3.16 is called the gospel in a nutshell. It's called the golden text of the Bible for a reason. Because it, it contains the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Great Commission affects the greatest commandments. The Great Commission affects the greatest communication. The Great Commission, number three, affects the greatest condemnation. What is the greatest condemnation? Revelation 20, 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Amen. Amen. Wow. The greatest condemnation is to hear these words, depart from me, I never knew you. We know that according to John 3.18, those that are without Christ are condemned already. So we have a great responsibility, a great job before us. The great, the great commission is the greatest commission that's ever been given. It affects the greatest commandments. It affects the greatest communication. It, it affects the greatest condemnation. And then number four, and lastly, and I know that you can amen this in your heart, the Great Commission affects the greatest change that anyone could ever have in their lives. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And if you're here today and you're saved, you know that to be true, that there's been a great change since we've been born again, as the, the, the camp song uh, could be sung from when I was a teenager. We used to sing that all, 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 all the time. Only the gospel can turn a cannibal into a Christian, a barbarian into a believer, a heathen into a holy priesthood. Only the gospel can turn a sinner into a saint. Amen. There's been a great change Amen. since I've been born again. The Great Commission is the greatest mission of all time. Why? Because Jesus is the greatest cause. Amen. Jesus who said, if I be lifted up, referring to the cross of Calvary, I will draw all men unto myself. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, who neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must Amen. be saved. Amen. My friend, this morning, the Great Commission is without a doubt the greatest commission ever given. And that brings us to number two this morning. We see one commission, but then secondly, we look at two considerations. Now, don't miss this. I want everyone to understand what we're about to talk about here. I believe when we look at our, our great commission, the, the greatest mission ever, and, and the command to do what Jesus told us to do, every believer 
needs to consider two things regarding that, that great commission. All right? So here they are. Number one, and, th and this is going to take you back, all right? But you have, to, you have to hear me out. Number one, obeying the great commission is our first job and highest responsibility. If the Great Commission is the greatest commission of all time, then there's only one reason why God has given us another year on this earth. Another month, another week, another day, yea, verily, another breath. And that is to tell people about Jesus Christ. If the Great Commission is the greatest commission of all time, then obeying that commission is our greatest responsibility and our first job. You say, Brother Bill, wait a second, for just a moment, uh, Brother Bill, I exist on this earth to bring glory to God. Yes, that is true, but what does that mean? Hear me out. What does it mean to bring glory to God? Uh, what, 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 is that, what is that talking about when we read that in the Bible? Well, to bring glory to God means that we, as believers, reflect and reveal to a lost and dying world, the moral attributes of God. That's why we exist. Why? Well, so that they may see our good works and in turn glorify our Father in heaven. Right? That's why we exist. We are the light of the world. And so, we. The, well, all I'm simply trying to say is this. The greatest way that you can glorify God is tell people about His Son. That's the greatest way to bring glory to God. Amen. Is to reflect and reveal the moral attributes of God before a lost and dying world tell, telling people about Jesus. You say, Brother Bill, I'm not trying to argue, Brother Bill, but I have a job. My job is I am a fill-in-the-blank. I, I work with computers. I'm a teacher. I, I'm a nurse. I, I'm a construction worker. I, I work in a factory. I, that's my job. No, my friend, listen very carefully. That is your profession. Your job is to tell people about Jesus. Amen. Do not get your job and your profession confused. Amen. Your profession helps you obey your one job. You use your profession to tell people about Jesus Christ. You say, well, I'm not allowed to do that in my profession. I would consider getting a different profession then. Because that is why we exist. Uh, it, was, um, it, it was William Carey who was confronted by one of his friends. William Carey said, listen, uh, if you stop this witnessing thing and concentrated more on your job then you would do better financially for your family and for yourself and William Carey said this my job my job my job is to cobble shoes or my job is to tell people about Jesus I only cobble shoes to pay expenses don't get your job and your perfect profession confused can you imagine if every believer in America had that mentality about their profession how we would turn this world upside down for the cause of Jesus Christ. I use my profession to obey my one job. And let me let me illustrate um, this morning with a uh, an illustration where I will uh, use you a, a, as um, a, as uh, a, an illustration. Okay, so I'm going to pick on some men here, Brother Shirt. Sorry, uh, I'm going I'm to pick on you, but we're going to pretend that this building this morning is a firehouse. Okay. And we're all firemen, firemen and firewomen, okay? And so in order for a firehouse to run smoothly, we need to have some chores. Uh, we need to do things decently and in order for the firehouse to run smoothly, so we have to have some chores. So, um, uh, Brother uh, Shirt, you're the cook. That's your chore. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I don't know if you can cook. <laughs> It's not a hospital illustration, it's a firehouse illustration. But anyway, you're the cook, all right? And then Brother Frank in the back, okay? It's Frank, right? Frank. Okay. Uh, it is your chore uh, to wash the fire trucks, 
Okay, is that good? So we need to have clean fire trucks, so that's your chore. And then preacher's job, uh, his chore is to ring the bell, okay? Because that's important when there's a fire, the bell, you know, gets rung and all of that. So, so uh, everybody, you got your chores down, right? Okay, so let's review just to make sure, and then we'll make our point. Uh, Brother Shirk, uh, your job is? You are the? I'm sorry, Brother Bell, but I'm the fireman. Okay, so he, he, he is, what's your, what's your uh, 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 job, Brother Frank? I'm going to keep the trucks clean. Okay, and your job? Uh, my profession yeah. is the uh, ring the bell. That's right. Okay, but your job, and Brother Shirk's already got me, uh, he, he, your job is what? Your job is to pull people from the fire. Okay, all right, so uh, I shouldn't have picked up. I shouldn't have asked him, okay, because... Uh, <laughs> He already knew where I was going with that. So, um, so anyway, the point is this. Don't get your job and your profession mixed up. If you're a fireman, your job is to, to pull people out of the fire. Don't get your chore and your job confused. And so uh, obeying the Great Commission is our first job and our highest response responsibility. Sometimes we look at the Great Commission this way. Um, sometimes we look at the Great Commission as it's one more uh, uh, one more thing to add to my list of duties as a Christian. In other words, when I get really spiritual and I get the Ten Commandments taken care of, then I'll concentrate on the Great Commission. Um, when I get really spiritual uh, and I get the Beatitudes taken care of, then I'll, I'll work on the Great Commission. And when I get the fruit of the Spirit taken care of, uh, then I'll worry about the Great Commission. But what I'm simply trying to say here this morning is this. That the Great Commission is not another rule for living. It is our one responsibility in life. And there is a difference. Amen. Amen. And so, consideration number one. Obeying the Great Commission is our first job and highest responsibility. Now, number two. Here's the second consideration. We will give an account for how we obeyed the Great Commission. Right. Amen. We will stand before God and we will give an account for what we did with our one job. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4 says, As we have been put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. And so as we have been put, uh, given the responsibility of the message of salvation, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, even so we speak. And so one day we will give an account for how we obeyed the Great Commission. Uh, years ago, I gave one of my boys a job. Uh, I was going to the store, and so I said to my son, I said, uh, listen, the trash needs to be taken out. And so I went to the store, I came back about an hour later, and um, the trash had not been taken out. Uh, a lot of things happened at that moment. One of them was my blood pressure went up. Uh, number two, my, the volume of my voice got louder. And then all kinds of words were spoken to my son. But one of the things that I said to my son at that time was this. I simply looked at him and said, I gave you one job. One job. You couldn't obey the one job that I gave you. Listen, one day we're going to stand before God. He's not going to have to ask the question because it's going to be understood. What did you do with the one job that I gave you? And so... The Great Commission is the greatest commission of all time. And based on that, every Christian needs to consider two very important truths. Obeying the Great Commission is our first job and highest responsibility. And number two, we will give an account for how we obey the Great Commission. And that brings me to our third point this morning. Three questions every believer needs to ask to help us discern where I stand with the Great Commission. Am I doing an adequate job? Am I doing a good job? Am I doing a stellar job? Am I doing a poor job with the Great Commission? In order to discern and figure that out, let me give three questions every believer needs to ask regarding where I stand with the Great Commission. Number one, and we'll end with these three questions. Number one, am I surrendered to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world? Am I surrendered? Am I willing? Do I have a conversation with the Lord where I've communicated that I am a willing vessel
to do whatever he wants me to do. Lord, I am willing to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. I'm willing. I'm willing. It appears every believer has this mentality about the Great Commission. I, um, I will go if the Lord calls me. But when you consider that the Great Commission is the greatest commission of all time, we really need to have this mentality. I'm going to go unless the Lord tells me to stay. I mean, think about it. If we exist to be salt and light and ambassadors, if we exist and we are here on this earth to fulfill and obey the Great Commission, we really ought to have this mentality. I'm going unless the Lord keeps me here. Not I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay here until the Lord calls me. And so we need, to, uh, we need to ask that question. Lord, can I say with an honest and sincere heart, I'm willing to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. Uh, there's young people in this sanctuary right now. Young people, can you honestly say with an honest and sincere heart that you are a willing vessel to be used however the Lord wants to use you? And if that means taking the gospel to a foreign field, I'm willing to do that. We're never going to be truly happy and have joy in our heart and our life until we're doing what the Lord wants us yeah. to do. And we're never going to really have joy and peace in our heart until we just put our hands up and say, Lord, I, I surrender. I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. Now, now that, that's uh, not always an easy thing. I may have shared this last time. My son Cooper, um, he went through this, this phase where he... He loves guns, all kinds of guns, squirt guns, nerf guns, laser guns, cowboy guns, army guns. He loves guns. And so he would go through this stage when he was little, and he would have these cowboy guns. These, this, he had this holster on, and he would have these cowboy guns, and, you know, these six shooters here on his, on his hip. And uh, you'd be walking through the house, and he would jump out from behind a wall, and he would pull those guns out, and he would say, stick them up. Now, if you wanted to play along, you'd be walking through the house, minding your own business. He would jump out from behind a wall and say, stick him up. If you wanted to play along, what would you do? You would put your hands up in the air. Stick, stick him up means what? Surrender, right? Now, I don't know how old he was, six years old, I don't know, but he didn't really understand the concept of surrender because he would jump out and say, stick him up. You'd put your hands up in the air and he'd go. <laughs> <laughs> it's not technically how it's supposed to work. Um, you wouldn't be a sheriff very long if you had that mentality. We often, young people here this morning, we have that mentality sometimes with God. If I surrender God, what will thou have me to do? Lord, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. We, we think God's going to punish us, don't we? God's going to send me to some horrible country, you know, and, and I'm never, ever going to be joyful or happy for the rest of my life because God's going to send me somewhere and I'm going to be miserable. Does God work that way? No. no. God doesn't work that way. You will never experience the most amount of joy, the most amount of peace, the, mono, the most amount of influence and victory in your life than if you are in the center of God's will doing exactly what He wants you to do. And if that's to take the gospel to the other most parts of the world, then so be it. That's where it's going to be. And so can you honestly say you're surrendered to do whatever the Lord... By the way, you're here, you're here today and you say, Brother Bill, I went forward one time in a church service. I went forward in a Christian camp. I went forward in a revival meeting. I gave my life to the Lord. I told the Lord that I'm willing to do whatever He wants me to do. I'm thankful for that. Every Christian ought to do that. But can I say this? I think yearly, maybe even more than that, I think a missions conference is a great time to do that. I think every Christian ought to remind the Lord you're still willing to do that. Just a reminder. Lord, I know I gave my life to you 20 years ago, but I want you to know I'm still willing to do whatever you want me to do. Pastor here, he's a pastor in this community, Liberty Baptist Church, and he needs to tell the Lord, Lord, Lord may move him. Lord may call him into mission. So Lord may, hey, we, we, we have to be willing to say, Lord, I'm still Still willing to do whatever you want me to do. So number one, am I surrendered to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world? Question number two, am I soul conscious in my Jerusalem? What makes us, here's a question, are you ready for this? This is convicting. What makes me think that I am surrendered to take the gospel across the sea when I will not take the gospel across the street? 
what makes me think I will care about their souls if I don't care about these people's souls? You say, Brother Bill, God has commanded us to take the gospel into all the world. I can't do that. I'm one person. No, you can't, but you can take the gospel into your world. You meet people on a daily basis at the bank, at the grocery store, at the convenience store, at the gas station that pastor will never meet. And God doesn't expect you to take the gospel and, and, and basically uh, take the gospel to every person in the entire world. But I think that you would understand this if every Christian on the planet just gave the gospel in their world, then we will turn our world upside down for the cause of Jesus Christ. Amen. You're only responsible for the people God gives you on a daily basis as far as giving the gospel. And so, am I soul conscious in my Jerusalem? And then lastly, here's the third question. And really, these three questions are going to be an outline. In other words, we're going to be preaching on these three things throughout the week. Okay, so I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to uh, spend too much time on them. They're really to prime the pump and get us thinking. But am I surrendered to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world? Number one. Number two. Am I soul conscious in my Jerusalem? And number three. Are you ready for this? Number three. And lastly, am I willing to sacrifice so that others can go on my behalf? Acts 1.8, uh, I believe, was referenced today uh, in Sunday school, but Acts 1.8 says that we are to be witnesses both in Jerusalem and the uttermost parts of the world. Listen, two important words there. Both and. It doesn't say either or. Amen. In other words, we are not exempt from the uttermost parts of the world. We have a responsibility to them. And if God has not called you to go, God has called you to give so that others can go. And, and it's almost like a contract. Listen, God hasn't called me to go, so will you go on my behalf because I'm responsible for them. So if we give so that you go on our behalf, then I, one day, when I stand in eternity, there will be souls there as a result of my giving. So that Amen. others can go on my behalf. It's go or give. That's it. But none of us are exempt from the uttermost. None of us. It's both and, not either or. And so are we willing to sacrifice so that others can take the gospel on our behalf? In 1732, two young Moravian men, Christian men, heard about an island in the West Indies where there was about 3,000 slaves. The owner of those slaves, the man in charge of the island, had made the claim that no missionary, no preacher will ever set foot on this island. He said if ever a preacher or a missionary becomes shipwrecked on our island, we will isolate him in a separate building until he's rescued because no one will speak to any of us, of, uh, of us about God. We don't have time for any of that stuff. 3,000 slaves snatched from the continent of Africa to live and die on an island without ever hearing of the Lord Jesus Christ one time. These two young men became so burdened about that that they devised a plan. Their plan was that they would sell themselves into slavery with the sole purpose of going to that island and telling people about Jesus Christ. The sacrifice, the risk was that they risked never being able to leave the island for the rest of their life. On the day of their departure, friends and family came down to the shore to wish them, uh, see them off. Um, many of them crying, all of them questioning, was this wise? Was this really necessary? As the gap widened from ship to shore, those two young men lock arms. And as history tells us, they both raised their hands and yelled at the top of their lungs so those on the shore could hear, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward for his suffering. And that became... That, that cry became the call of the Moravian, the modern Moravian movement, missionary movement, 
where history tells us one out of every four Moravian Christians surrendered to take the gospel around the world. Think about that. One out of every four Moravian Christians became a missionary. You know what we are told today in the United States of, um, of America? One Christian out of every seven churches becomes a missionary. We, we, we've come a long way from, from back then, 1732. So two young men willing to make this effort to reach those slaves. Why? Because two men were clearly soul conscious. Two men were clearly surrendered. Two young men were clearly willing to sacrifice. Two young men who took the Great Commission Seriously, what about you this morning? What about you? What are we doing with our one job? You know, I have found this, that when I'm not doing what God has created me to do, I'm of all men most miserable. Do you know why most Christians aren't very happy? Why most Christians have lost their joy? It's because they're not doing what they've been created to do. What are we going to do with the one job that God has given us and left us here on this earth? Are we surrendered? to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world? Are we soul conscious? And are we willing to sacrifice? This is what a missions conference is all about. It's reminding us of the Great Commission. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, we have a time of invitation where we just ask you, uh, you're here today, you say, Brother Bill, God is speaking to my heart about something specific. I don't need to know what it is that's between you and the Lord. But uh, we want to give you an opportunity to pray. And where do you stand regarding the Great Commission? Where, where, do, you align, where do you line up? And uh, however the Lord is leading, we give you this opportunity to make decisions based on the authority of Scripture. When we look at the Scripture, we don't align or line up correctly. We don't move the Scripture. We don't, we don't uh, twist the scripture. No, we, we align ourselves up with the authority of scripture. So may God help us to do that. You know, God wants decisions because of this missions conference. God wants decisions to be made that will last for eternity. So may God help us with whatever God is, is laying upon our heart. Father, we love you. Thank you for the privilege of studying your word. We thank you for um, the Christians who are willing to do whatever you would have them to do. Christians that have opened their hearts and their lives to receive the power of your word. Father, we know, we believe with all of our heart that you are pleased with this church <coughs> and these days of Missions Conference. Father, someone once said that when we get excited about what you're excited about, then you get excited about us. Lord, help us to get excited about what you're excited about. And Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name.